With sunny sun I set my scene, on bind to sun to see the mean. With many airs I sat in bells, some mandinkas and some were loves. Uh, you'll be surprised <laughs> how I entered today. Yes, because today I'm dealing with a performance poet, a spoken word artist from the United States. And so we were dealing with uh, what we call beat poetry. That's going to be the theme of today. And we're dealing with uh, Paul Richmond. Who is this man? Meet me on the other side. And we'll discuss extensively there. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful show. Today, we're with um, Paul Richmond. Um, who is this great writer on the screen with us today? Paul Richmond has been into creative writing and uh, music, especially performance poetry, for over four decades. I mean it, 40 years he has been into this uh, creative world. And uh, he has taught different parts of the world, projecting peace, love, unity among human race. He has been to Africa, he has been to Europe, different parts you can talk about. And um, the only mission he has been conveying to the world is unity through art, unity through creativity. Unity through beat poetry. Unity through performance poetry. Unity through music. So, not to waste much of our time, I want us to go deeply into his world. He will say a lot. Within his own words, you get to see who this great writer is. So, Paul Rittman, please welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, what a great platform, and thank you for getting this out there. The word is really important for people to... Uh, feel that their voice has power. Not to waste much of our time, uh, uh, I want you to really give us brief history of um, creative world of the state, especially the beat poetry in relation to the United States. Okay, uh, I'll try to make this, I mean, there's a, a vast history, as you know, with each country, uh, what, how people wrote and what they went on. Uh, beat poetry kind of is uh, doesn't really have a conventional form. So there's you could say there is a tradition, but uh, the tradition is followed by the fact that people wanted to explore opening up what forms there were. Uh, you know, and, and literature was very had a number of rules or a number of things that you know things should rhyme or there are couplets or you know things had they had a lot of different uh, in any art form. Suddenly, when someone suddenly decides to paint differently, everyone's going, what's going on? You're not supposed to paint outside the lines. Um, this is, you know, beat poetry, I think, came along when people felt that poetry was isolated. It was in the, uh, you know, education only or, you know, in the, in the academic world, sort of. Uh, and they started to have readings in lofts, people's living rooms, and it promoted that everybody had a voice and that everybody uh, could try to use that voice and speak what was going on to them. That it didn't have to be flowery or uh, something about the light coming through the window, hitting something. It could be about that you were depressed or lonely or you were watching the, the earth being destroyed or something like that that you wanted to express your feelings about. And so it opened up what people could talk about, how they could talk about it, um, it merged with uh, jazz, which was also on the outside of the music realms of what people thought was music. Uh, that experimentation, trying new things, playing with sounds. Again, it's kind of a lot of different information. I would say definitely check it out, and, but it comes from that tradition. Uh, and I um, you know, got attracted to that tradition also through many rock groups, um, used poetry following up in the 60s after the beats uh, which then turned me on to the beats thank you for giving us this brief uh, um intro to the poetry i mean the national beat poetry in the states uh, i remember vividly that um uh, Tosun debbie happened to be 
one of the champions of uh, this great foundation, or the main champion anyway, the key behind the door of National Beat Poetry Foundation in the United States. And um, uh, if you look at it historiographically, we also have uh, Allen uh, Ginsberg too, as um, the key founder with uh, Jack uh, Kerrers and uh, William Burroughs too, uh, who initiated the beat poetry itself. But the foundation, we give kudos to uh, Debbie uh, Tosun, who is tirelessly working towards sustaining this uh, unique aspect of uh, poetry, beat poetry. Uh, uh, not to uh, waste much of our time, let's go into this second part. You became the beat poet laureate for Massachusetts between 2017 and 2019. How did you become a beat poet in the first place? And if, if you are an artist, many times you can be applying to things or trying to send submissions. Uh, that's not what happened with me. There's another route. Um, if you believe in your art and you just keep doing your art, various doors open. So I was creating word festivals. I used to do poetry festivals, but people, when they hear the word poetry right away, oh, I don't like poetry or I don't understand poetry. And so I changed my festivals to being called word festivals. And people came and then they would say, is that poetry? I was like, I don't know. Did you like it? Uh, yeah, I liked it. Okay, so it somehow they had a negative image because of how the poetry they had in school or something else. And I wanted to open up the idea that I was creating, just like yourself, in a way, I was creating stages and venues for people to express words, whether it was a prose poem or it was a poem or it rhymed or they sang it or it was a short story that we were honoring, taking the time to listen and because I actually set up times, I, I had little science, uh, sand timers that you flipped and you had five minutes. And when the sand was gone, you were gone. And so it relaxed everybody out. We said, we're going to give everybody a chance. Please listen to the person when they have their sand. And when your sand is gone, it's the next person. Um, and so I was doing that. My festival is 10 years old through that process. The folks from the Beat uh, Foundation had their own events. They started to come to my events. Uh, we became friends. They watched me perform. They invited me to a couple of events to read. And then I was then, a, they suddenly gave me the award. So I didn't necessarily search them out or send something in hoping to get the award or anything. Uh, many of the uh, people who the organization honors don't know sometimes about the organization they research just like yourself you're researching the world for who are the poets and what's going on and then you're contacting them so most people aren't necessarily contacting you and, and saying that and so that was my history i was just out there going to festivals hitting stages practicing my my art and you know eventually i ran into them and they then decided to honor me with that award so by the way before we now extensively dig deeply into the world of uh, the beatports through you uh, let us know what brought you into the creative world how did you become a creative writer and a poet I would say that, first of all, so uh, maybe people think that in America, you know, we have the best education and all this. We don't. Um, and um, uh, through in, in the 1950s, when I was going through school, no one really taught me how to study. Uh, I was under some delusion that you just knew this information. I didn't take books home to read. I wasn't doing anything. And I would be in the classroom and people would raise their hand and say, oh, I know the answer to that. And I would wonder, geez, I wonder how they knew that, which sounds kind of ridiculous. It's the information's in the books, but you have to read them. But I couldn't really read them. And uh, there was a part in my life where for some reason I was part of an experiment where they showed us the word and we were supposed to memorize the word like world. We didn't 
we didn't learn the pronunciation. We didn't know that W had a sound or anything. They were supposed to come back to teach us that, and they hadn't. And that was one of the first times where my father thought I was being a smart ass by not answering. I asked him how to spell something, and he said, you know, say the word. I said it, and he said, well, I was like, well, I don't know. What does that mean, you know? So I'm just giving that history that I didn't have a strong uh, background to writing or reading. As I started to read, I got excited, and uh, though I was put down because I was reading way below my grade level, but I finally got into reading some books. When I started to, in the 70s, when, 60s, when I started to hitchhike, I, st I decided to keep a journal, and I suddenly noticed I wasn't really writing within the lines. My writing was awful. I didn't know how to spell a lot of the words that I was doing. I got frustrated because I would try to you know, write the words, but then I would lose the thoughts. Um, but I just kept at that because I was on the road. And um, I, you know, I realized I was getting better and better. I got turned on to then a lot of, you know, William Burroughs and various beat poets uh, and other writings. And so I started reading and that encouraged me to realize, oh, maybe I could create my own form of writing uh, that I didn't have to follow the other writings that were going on. Thank you for sharing this. Um, the, uh, I learned something today. So it's not even long, not too long ago that America really revolutionized their education system. So there wasn't much meaningful system in place, even as at uh, early 60s or late 50s, uh, when it comes to literacy in the country. So there was no proper pedagogical system that could help people to learn or, or how to read and write properly in the States. And um, a professional juggler indeed. I love how you manage to twist your way to get your way out of Norway. Um, you've traveled to different parts of the world, yes. Uh, but I want you to focus on uh, one of the things you mentioned. You are a performance poet. Tell us briefly about your performance poetry within the United States and even outside the United States. Well, I, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to just in January be in Africa in uh, Senegal at Sobo Body. And I went there with the Afri uh, Senegal American Project by Tony Baca. And he's a percussionist who is in the band, quote, band that I have called Do It Now. Um, that came about similar to the story I was just saying. I, all these people were in the valley that are in uh, John Sheldon and Joe um, Salins. And I've, we've never really interacted. I hooked up here and there with um, Tony. Uh, he came to a couple of my poetry events. Um, and one day I just, I woke up with the thought of, you know, a lot of people have put music to their writings. A lot of people have done other things. I would like to ask these three guys who turn out to be some of the best players in the Valley. And I was pleasantly surprised that they all wanted to work with me and just even check it out. Uh, so we met and um, I had an interesting thing that I was saying to them. They all have so many projects that they're doing. I was just letting them know I wasn't trying to pull them from their other projects I just wanted to experiment with some stuff. And they wanted, they asked me, what did they, I want them to play? And I said, I didn't, I wasn't going to tell them what to play. They, I feel they are very accomplished, listen to each other. They were also excited because for whatever reason, they hadn't played together. Even though they were all well known in the Valley, somehow they didn't come together. And so by me asking them to do this project, they came together. And they got excited after one or two times of us working together about, oh, this is going to be fun. We're really trying, experimenting. And the difference is, is that I'm listening. I'm not a lead singer. I am, as I, you know, you've probably seen some of the videos. I have my poetry and I'm, it's kind of a thing where, you know, we're on stage and I'm watching the other performers and they're listening. And when I was in Senegal, I couldn't speak, you know, very much. And I basically said to the, musicians there, I kind of went, we're going to, meaning we're going to watch each other, 
we're going to listen to each other and we're going to do it with heart. And they all smiled uh, because it was just sign language. And when we got on stage, everybody was there with each other, letting other people go, let this person have some time, let me have some time. And that's the kind of style that I'm listening to the music and figuring out how to come in. Uh, some of my stuff is improvised. I have papers with some of the poems, but the music changes all that. And you realize when you work with music, you might have three stanzas, but you basically only get through two of them. And it seems that it works. Um, because sometimes as a writer, you know, you think, oh, no, that last stanza said it all. You know, I finally got it. And after the show, somebody would tell you what was that last stanza, even though I didn't say it. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, I had to get used to realizing I just need to be present with these musicians. Uh, and that was a that was an amazing thing that I felt uh, from being in Senegal and meeting those um, musicians over musicians in other parts of the world because I did some music when I was in Hungary uh, in Budapest there were jazz musicians they brought when I was in Sweden there was some jazz musicians they brought uh, people I did not know never played with jumped on the stage and the difference was in uh, Senegal was people really talked about the spirit and that the music was for the people and that they were there uh, you know giving something it was it was a, an important moment to be sharing with people and they were that was what they were giving uh and you know that doesn't mean that other people don't have that but it was very strong in in the musicians that i met in senegal yeah you've you've taught different parts of the world but i'm pleased personally pleased that uh, uh among all this uh tour of all this tour the most memorable one to you is the one that took you to the root of human race. That's Africa, and specifically Senegal. Um, uh, do you feel that uh, if you're invited next time to return to the root of human race, you will not hesitate to grab the opportunity? Yes, I would. All the, uh, well, hopefully we're trying to bring a number of the Senegal musicians that we met here, and some of them have been mm -hmm. here before, so we're trying to bring them back to do more performing here. Uh, right now, as a performer, you know, this virus has totally changed everything. All my yeah. work, all my work is closed down. It was since March, I was already having cancellations for the summer. And now it my festival's not happening in the fall. The town that I have it in said, and so I don't see anything happening until next year, spring, maybe. Um, so that's pretty tough on you know anybody who i mean that's how i make my living and do stuff and um but so it's um and you know as an artist you you need an audience and thank you for this audience wanting to be out and be performing and we it's we have to do it very differently now yeah yeah i know what you're talking about it's called cora k-o-r-a especially in the gambia so in the gambia region anyway they call it cora is uh, traditional musical instruments with just a thread and a uh, line of this. So I understand what you're referring to. It makes, it's a unique uh, instrument. No one will listen to that and how they play it that will not be moved. So uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 is really a challenge for everyone, especially the artists. We just hope everything will be changed for the better and uh, the world will go back to their normal uh, trend. So. Uh, let's let's look at this. Um, you've been featured aside from uh, even the uh, beat poetry uh, feature that you are getting involved in these days. Uh, you've been featured in different platforms. Of all of them, which one would you refer to as your the favorite or the most favorite ones? Any art form or anything you could say, and unfortunately or just how it is, there becomes a hierarchy of, you know, oh, no, these people are considered writers and, and this publication only picks those people that they think are writers. I mean, the problem with some of it is, is, you know, one person likes your stuff and somebody else doesn't. Uh, depending on who they are, does that mean it's good or bad? Um, 
it's always nice when there were these publications that were seen as, you know, the bigger publications or something <laughs> noteworthy that then wanted to publish my stuff. So you would have that moment of like, wow, OK, I made it into that publication, you know. Uh, when I received the, you know, um, a thing from the Beat Poets, you know, they produced this book for me. So, you know, that was a big thing that they wanted a whole book and they wanted to publish it saying that uh, I was the Beat Poet Laureate. So, you know, it's just along the way of different things. Um, and I think where it's not almost in publications, like I went to the Austin... Uh, International Poetry Festival in Texas a number of years and after going a number of years I was then asked to be one of the features so that made me feel like I had gone through doing the work being on the stages people seeing me and then I was being acknowledged that yes we want to make sure that people see you so I think it's that kind you know everybody's and your own sense of achievement comes in different ways as you go along. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, I guess we have to go for a break. Uh, but this time around, I want us to consider the rock guys in Senegal, where we had Paul actively involved there. See you there. a story on him. He was famous for two weeks. He was known as the rock guy. He tried to sell rocks to tourists, but he ended up at his old corner with his old sign. He was a homeless vet. He would work for food. He would work for food. But if you need a rock, he's got one. Welcome back once again, dear viewers. Um, this is Artflix, if you are joining us for the first time. And uh, we're in the new world, in the United States. We're dealing with uh, Paul Richmond. Uh, Paul Richmond has been exploring with us the world of the states, its activities within and outside the country. But now we'll be focusing exclusively on um, the beat poetry. That's our, our theme for the day. Um, Tell us about your achievements during your ten hours day, uh, Massachusetts State uh, Poet Laureate between 2017 and 2019. Uh, well, not. I mean, see, I think that's interesting. That is an interesting question. Well, so again, as I explained, I mean, I run a number of word stages. So I have my big festival, which sometimes is four to six days. I do a monthly reading, which happens every third Tuesday. There's a big, uh, what they call Garlic and Arts Festival, which is an interesting thing. People started, these farmers came out, wanted to grow organic garlic, and they wanted to combine the arts and food. And the first festival they had, they had 1,000 people. Now they have 12,000 people who come. Eight years ago, I convinced them to have a stage uh, that was called the Word Stage. So... 
I thought, you know, there's a music, because they're separated all over the, this field. So you have a music stage, you have a family stage. And I said, let, you know, there's enough writers. Let's have a word stage. Let's encourage people to come to listen to words, you know. And so they agreed. I set up the stage. So when I became, um, when I was nominated or given that award for the state, really all it changed was is that, um, you know, we live in a society who wants to know whether or not you have a Ph.D., you know, or are you a master's or did you win this award or, you know. So really what changed is the advertising that I was now the Beat Poet Laureate and I was running a word stage at the festival or that it got me a few more, um, um, you know, interviews. I mean, a funny part about it, it was announced. I announced it. And I. And this is something for new writers. You know, don't be discouraged by not getting any response or uh, not hearing from anybody because I contacted a whole bunch of papers and stuff to say, hey, I, I'm the new Beat Poet Laureate, you know, nothing and didn't get a call. And then there was a state um, organization for the state of Massachusetts of poetry that I've gone to some of their festivals and I just happened to meet the new director at some event and she asked me some questions and I told her and she decided to put it up on the state page. Well, because it was on now the Massachusetts Poetry State page, all of a sudden the phone rang again. Oh, we want to do an interview with you. So you never really know how that's going to unfold. You have to be out there yourself and you have to realize, you know, just because you're out there, it doesn't happen. And you have to keep being who you are and then, it, you know, it will fall into place or it won't. So really, that's uh, what changed is I, in a way, I didn't change. I just tried to utilize the award to already focus on the other poets that I'm promoting, the stages I was promoting. Um, it gave me a little bit, a bit of a boost to believe in myself, to just keep going. Um, so I'd say that was really the change. Yeah. Don't wait for people. To voice for you go out and voice for yourself this is a very important message thank you so much yeah you you said you were unhappy with the situation in the country um uh, can you elucidate uh, tell us how you feel about this situation go deeply into this um aspect that you just uh, threw into the discussion how do you feel about the situation and what are you doing to make the change? Uh, first of all, I did a lot of, I mean, uh, as a quote juggler, um, I was in schools a lot. And actually before that, when I was in Buffalo, I did teach at the University of Buffalo for about seven years. And then I left that because I didn't like where the educational system was going. And then I went out and I, I could say I joined the circus. I went to, I, I became a, a juggler and uh, but then I realized that um, juggling was a great way to meet uh, for students to acknowledge or think about what they have to do to learn something. Because everybody will say, I can't juggle. And I've never found anybody who can't if they put in the time. Some people might take longer than others. You have to learn the right way to do it so that you can do it. But I would hand props, or I used to try to make it as easy as possible. I'm getting this is kind of related to what I'm seeing happen in the country. I saw that educationally, the arts were always being cut. And the arts are an amazing way for people to explore themselves, to have critical thinking, to learn how to express themselves. And I just thought, wait a minute, if you're trying to have a democracy, aren't you trying to encourage the people of that country that you want to have a democracy to be well educated be able to feel that they can speak their minds have skills to be able to speak their minds and not seeing it as a sporting event that i'm not here you're one team and i'm another and we're not exchanging ideas i'm here to beat you you know or i'm here to make you have my idea and that whole process of what is going on in our country and over the last number of years that I watched in education of cutting out the arts, 
that we didn't just get here overnight. This is a couple of generations of not appreciating arts, not really being given abilities to communicate, to think, um, changing history. And so, you know, when you ask people about some stuff, they act like, oh, no, you know, the slaves enjoyed working on the plantations or something, you know. And you go, what are you talking about? Um, and so this is um, what I, you know, right now it's a scary thing to watch that there almost isn't an ability to have those conversations. And our present president and rest of the lot part of our rest of our government, because it's not just him, our government is not stopping him. Um, so they're as much to blame as he is. And they're kind of, you know, just keep throwing gasoline on fires. They're not saying, let's come to the table to sit down and what is your truth? I mean, if we sat down and went around the room, we'd each realize each of us is speaking truth. And then it becomes a complicated question of how to solve that all those truths can happen. Um, and what does that mean, you know? So it's scary now to see the use of violence and... Uh, the use of hatred and right away pointing to somebody else saying, you know, no, it's the refugees or no, it's Mexicans or no, it's Muslims or no, Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group or, you know, all these wacky statements that you go, you know, that's, you know, why is that being allowed to be said? And then be allowed to say it and you live in a culture that promotes uh, violence and guns and somehow they were the wild west still or something you know, where has the gun been? and you know um, the rest of the world feels that way about america i mean most americans can't figure out why so many countries hate us and it's like because we bomb them we you know use drones we use sanctions we use all kinds of things that you know force countries to be slaves in a way and so that hasn't changed, we're, you know, it's, in terms of what we're doing and why people are, you know, upset with the fact that we act like we just, we don't, we don't interact, we tell people what we're going to do. You are absolutely right. The situation there is pathetic. People are unhappy within the country, even outside the country. I just hope uh, uh, Americans will manage to redeem their image within and outside the country. Um, immigrants are not safe within the country and uh, even people living in their own country are scared of the coming of the United States uh, with war, with crisis and then coming back to say they are rescuing them. This is what is happening and that's why hatred is spreading across the globe. So what advice do you have for your fellow uh, creative writers on uh, how they can contribute towards making these positive changes that you want or you desire for the country? Well, like I think any time through history um, depends on how much the repression starts to continue. Writers have been killed, tortured, artists. You know, we see this all the time with poets in Iran, Iraq, you know, various other places all over the world poets and writers and artists are if they don't state whatever the line is that the government is saying that this is what you're supposed to say um so i think you have to become creative you have to look throughout history to see what examples there were some people had to leave their countries and still keep doing their writing or skills to keep doing their performing i mean some people were uh political by their dance uh, I remember a thing about Pete Seeger going to, I don't remember which country it was, but the, you know, the dictator at that country said to him, you're not allowed to sing that song. And he knew that everybody in the audience wanted him to sing that song. And so what he did was when he got on the stage, he said, okay, I'm not supposed to sing this song, but you all know the words. And he started playing it and the whole audience sang the song. And so they couldn't stop that. And he said, I didn't sing the song, you know. I mean, they could have gotten violent with him, but 
they kind of realized how many people were in what, and they didn't want to uprising of that. So I think now, you know, I'm a little worried with what's just happened in the last couple of days, more than worried. It's scary of in um, Oregon, these unidentified military folks that you normally see in Central American countries, which usually is the CIA or other groups, um, you know, kidnapping people, scaring people to say, be quiet. Um, and there's some threats that they're going to try to do this in other places. So this really needs to be stopped now in uh, Oregon, and we'll see what happens. I mean, right now, the governors and everybody is saying, you know, you have to get out of our state, stop this, and they're not. And I think if we look through history, it's just not a matter of saying, you know, with any bully, hey, could you stop punching me? You know, I mean, maybe the bully will listen. Maybe you have to have five friends behind you. And then the bully goes, oh, OK, uh, I'm going to get, you know, beat up here or, you know, uh, and then sometimes some bullies don't stop there either. Um, so it's a, you have to really um, think about um, what you're going to say. Also, I think there's and it's important thing that people need hope. And in our writings, whether through humor or other ways, I mean, I could be talking about all these things, but then do I bring you down or do you feel like, okay, that was a funny story about what we know is going on uh, and that we are, you're being, um, it's funny, uh, you want, you know, it, it still gets the point across, but it gives hope. Yeah, no doubt about that. I'm, I'm 100% sure so what you have said is absolutely right. And um, the message is really deep. But as far as our culture is concerned, my viewers will never let you go without giving them something that will last with them. Especially when they remember Paul Richman. What do you have for our viewers at home before you go? Uh, believe in yourself. Find your voice, feel strong in using your voice, and realize how important your voice is to you and to the people around you. Well, very deep message. Believe in yourself. Very brief. But if you want to achieve in life, you should understand that to achieve in this world, to get anything in this world, you need to believe in yourself. You must always learn to say, I can not I can't. The day you remove I can't from your life, that's the day you'll be seeing positivity in everything you touch. And that's the message of this great writer. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope next time we'll have more to discuss, at least for the sake of humanity. Viewers, this is where we have to end the show today. We will be touring the world of other great writers in different corners of this great world. We can only make change if we're together, especially when we're borderless. Borderless with love, with unity, with understanding. Thank you for watching CBA and thank you for watching Atflex on CBA TV.